Hello and welcome. Today let's talk about another very fascinating subject. This is called microbiology. We'll get into all the different microbes and check all this good stuff out. Next here, let's go through and actually define microbiology. Now when we talk about microbiology, I want you to know microbiology is going to be defined as the study of microbes. Microbiology is the study of microbes. Now this term microbes that we use, I want you to know is a term that's going to include bacteria, it will include archaea, it will include protus, it will include fungi, it will include viruses, it will include viroids, and it will include prions. Most, but not all of these organisms are so small that they are going to require a microscope to be seen. They are that small. In microbiology, you're going to be looking at them under microscopes in the labs. Bacteria and other microbes are incredibly numerous in our air, in our soil, in our water, and also on objects and on objects. There are disease-causing microbes that we're going to hear of, and there's also beneficial ones that we're going to talk about also. These beneficial ones, we'll see, they're going to be essential for human health, and they're going to be essential in the proper functioning of the biosphere. So we can see many microbes are going to cause human disease, and others are going to provide important benefits. Now here when we talk about microbes that benefit the environment, I would like you to know that some bacteria and fungi are going to function as decomposers. And they're going to help recycle nutrients that can be used by plants and by animals. As we talk microbes that benefit the environment, you can see photosynthetic algae and other protists are going to be considered primary producers and they capture solar energy or inorganic material. And what they do then is they provide nutrients for more complex organisms. Now, when we talk microbes that benefit the environment, we'll see where we're going to refer to them as beneficial bacteria. And this will include photosynthetic bacteria. This will include bacteria that processes waste products, oil spills, or toxic compounds. Now, when we talk microbes that are used in industrial processes, they're going to be used in food processing. Also, antibiotics. Antibiotics were discovered in certain microbes. And we'll see microbes are going to be used in mass production of drugs such as insulin and in vaccines. Now, all on the subject of vaccines, when we talk vaccines for COVID, one company that's producing vaccines, it's producing vaccines by using adenovirus. Next, then, let's talk about archaea. Let's talk archaea. Now, when we talk archaea, archaea and bacteria are both prokaryotes. They are both prokaryotes, but each is going to be placed in its own domain. However, each is going to be placed in its own domain, and the reason why is because of the molecular and cellular differences between the two. Prokaryotes are going to be single-celled organisms. And they are going to lack the nuclei and membrane-bound cytoplasmic organelles that are going to be found in eukaryotic cells. Here we've got this table. This table, it compares both archaea and eukarya to one another. So here we can see the first difference we talked about, the nucleus and organelles. And then down here when we talk introns, histones, RNA polymerase, and methionine, you can see here, these will be some similarities that they'll both share. Now let's talk archaea in greater detail. Now when we talk archaea, archaea, they're usually going to be found ranging in size from about 0.1 to about 15 micrometers in size. They range in size from about 0.1 to about 15 micrometers in size. 
their genome is going to be a single closed circular DNA molecule. And archaea will see reproduce asexually by binary fission. They reproduce asexually by binary fission. Archaea are going to have a mono layer. They're going to have a mono layer of lipids, so a single layer of lipids with branched side chains instead of a lipid bilayer that we have in eukaryotic cells. This characteristic is going to help archaea tolerate acid and heat environments. We'll see archaea thrive in unusual environmental conditions and in extreme habitats. So here we can see how they're going to be found in extreme habitats. Some are going to thrive in salty environments. Some will thrive in these hot environments. And some will thrive in these anaerobic swampy environments. Next, then, let's talk about the different types of archaea. There's three main types, and they're going to be based on unique habitats and metabolism. So again, there's three main types of archaea, and they're going to be distinguished on their unique habitats and their metabolic activities. So number one, we have halophiles. Number two, we have thermophiles. And number three, we have methanogens. Some are going to be found in moderate environments, for example, lake sediments and in soil. And also, they're going to have a possible role in nutrient recycling. Now, some are going to have a symbiotic relationship with animals. For example, sponges with sea cucumbers and also the digestive tract of humans. Next in here, we can see when we talk halophiles, halophiles are going to also be known as our salt lovers. They're also known as our salt lovers. So they live in salty habitats. Now, halophiles are usually found in areas of high salt concentrations, okay, such as the Great Lakes, the Dead Sea, and also hypersaline soils. Their plasma membranes have chloride pumps that are going to contain a light-powered protein. It's called halorhodopsin. And they're going to pump chloride and water into the cell to prevent dehydration. Some halophiles are going to carry out photosynthesis using the pigment bacterial rhodopsin instead of chlorophyll. And then next we have our thermoacetophiles. Our thermoacetophiles, they are going to be found living in extremely hot, acidic, aquatic environments such as hot springs, or we can see geysers, and also in underwater volcanoes. Their lipid membranes and proteins have evolved so that way they function at temperatures as high as 80 degrees Celsius. One species, Picrophilus tortoise, it survives at a pH of less than 1. 12% of its genes encode transport proteins on its plasma membrane, and they're going to be assumed to be involved in pumping excess hydrogen ions out of the cell. And then third, we have our methanogens. Our methanogens are going to be chemoautotrophs, and they're going to use carbon dioxide and hydrogen as an energy source. And what they do is they produce methane as a byproduct. Methanogens, they live in anaerobic environments such as swamps, lake sediments, rice paddies, and also in the intestines of animals. Methane is going to be a greenhouse gas which may contribute to global warming. Some scientists have suggested changing the diet or developing a vaccine to help inhibit the growth of these archaea in cows. All right, next then, let's talk about our bacteria in greater detail now. When we talk about our bacteria, bacteria we'll see are going to be the most common type of prokaryote found on Earth. About 9,000 different species have been identified or named. But the number of unnamed species, we'll see the number of unnamed species is probably in the tens of millions. It's probably in the tens of millions. Bacteria are going to be found virtually in every environment on Earth. Now when we talk bacterial size and structure, We'll see most bacteria are going to be between 0.2 
and about 10 micrometers in size. Bacteria are going to have three basic shapes to them. We can have rod-shaped bacteria. For example, we have bacillus. In the plural form, it will be known as bacilli. And then we have spherical-shaped bacteria. Our spherical-shaped bacteria will include our coccus. Plural form, it will be known as the cocci. And then we also have spiral-shaped or helical or curved bacteria. For example, that will include spirillium. In the plural form, it will be known as spirillia. Here we can see a bacillus or a coccus can occur singly or they may occur in a particular arrangement. For example, when cocci form a cluster, they're going to be known as staphylococci. Whereas cocci that form chains, they're going to be known as streptococci. Here we can see we've got the three different shapes. We've got bacilli or rod-shaped bacteria. And here we have cocci or spherical-shaped bacteria. And then here we have spirillium or curved bacteria. So again, if we look at each of them in greater detail, you can appreciate each one here by themselves. Let's look at the structure of bacterium. Here's a bacterial cell. I'd like you to know all bacterial cells are going to have a plasma membrane. We have seen this before as well. All bacterial cells are going to have a plasma membrane, which is going to be a lipid bilayer, which is similar to the plasma membrane in plant and animal cells. We'll see most bacterial cells are going to be further protected by a cell wall. This cell wall, we'll see, is going to be made up of peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is a polymer of amino acids, hence the peptido part, and sugars, hence the glycan part of the name. And they're going to make up the cell wall of all bacteria. I'd like you to know bacteria are going to be classified by differences in their cell walls, which are going to be detected using staining methods. The most common test is going to be Gram's stain. Bacteria here will see that stain purple to a blue, they're going to be called gram-positive bacteria. They'll be called gram-positive bacteria, and they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. If the bacteria stains red or pink, it is considered a gram-negative bacteria. You can see they will have no peptidoglycan, or they'll have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. And their outer membrane, we can see, is going to be made up of lipopolysaccharide, LPS. We'll see some bacteria are going to have a polysaccharide layer outside the cell wall, and that's going to be called the capsule. And that will be called the capsule. And here we can see that very well, right here then on the outside. And then we can also see Motile bacteria are going to have flagella for locomotion. These are structurally different from eukaryotic flagella. And then we can see some bacteria are going to have fimbriae. The fimbria is going to be used to bind to various surfaces. Certain bacteria that infect the urinary tract, they use fimbriae to attach to the cell surfaces. So again, you can appreciate that there very nicely. Next here, then, we can see when we talk bacterial size and structure, most bacteria are going to have a single circular chromosome, which is going to be found located in the nucleoid region. And then many are going to have a plasmid. That's an accessory ring of DNA that's going to carry certain genes, such as antibiotic resistance. Bacteria also contain ribosomes and various types of storage granules.
So here we can see all the components in relation to the bacterial cell that are going to be found outside the cell and that are going to be found inside the cell. So here's all the outside structures, and here we have all the inside structures. Next then, let's talk bacterial reproduction and gene transfer. Bacteria, I want you to know, reproduce asexually by what's called binary fission. The bacterial cell, it replicates its genome, and then it divides into two new daughter cells. And then each daughter cell is going to be a clone. It's an exact copy of the other cell. Generation time, you can see, can be as short as 20 minutes to a day or more. In harsh conditions, I want you to know some bacteria, they can form a resistant endospore. That's going to be a thick-walled, dehydrated structure. And this endospore is not for reproduction. It's going to be to survive. It's to survive harsh conditions. So here we can see a nice picture of binary fission taking place. All right, next, and I'd like you to know that there's no sexual reproduction in prokaryotes. There are three mechanisms of genetic recombination here. One is conjugation, where the donor cell is going to pass DNA to a recipient cell by way of a sex pilus. And then we also have transformation, where the bacterium is going to take up DNA from the environment released by a dead bacteria. And then third, transduction, where viruses carry bacterial DNA from cell to cell. All right, now let's talk bacterial metabolism. When we talk bacterial metabolism, I would like you to know that bacteria have a remarkable range of metabolic abilities. Most bacteria we'll see are heterotrophic. They are heterotrophs. They are going to have to eat other things like plants and animals to survive. They are going to require an outside source of organic compounds just like animals do. Just like animals do. And some are going to be anaerobic and they cannot use oxygen as their final electron acceptor. So instead, they use sulfate or nitrate. Now we'll see other bacteria are chemoautotrophs. They reduce carbon dioxide to an organic compound by using electrons that are going to be derived from chemicals. So they'll use electrons from ammonia, hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, or certain minerals such as iron. Some bacteria are photosynthesizers, and they're going to use solar energy. They will use solar energy to produce their own food. For example, cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria have chlorophyll and other pigments. Cyanobacteria, we can see, evolved about 3.8 billion years ago and introduced most of the oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere. Other photosynthetic bacteria, they split hydrogen sulfide instead of water to produce sulfur as a byproduct. To produce sulfur as a byproduct. Some we'll see are going to be capable of nitrogen fixation and carbon fixation. Here we can appreciate a couple of nice pictures of cyanobacteria. So right inside of here and then right inside of here as well. Next, then let's talk about bacterial diseases in humans. We'll see most bacteria, we said, do not cause diseases, but some do. Pathogenic bacteria are going to have genes that code for virulence factors, and they'll determine the type and the extent of the illness. Let's talk first E. coli. We can see E. coli strains are going to be found living in our large intestine, and they cause no harm. However, there's one strain that's called E. coli 0157H7. Oh, it's a very dangerous strain. It can generate a toxin that damages the lining of the intestine. It also has virulence factors that are going to help it to stick to the intestinal lining. Next, then we can see streptococcus infections. When we talk streptococcus infections, they're going to cause more disease than any other bacteria. Here you can see we have various types of streptococcus. We have streptococcus pneumoniae. It's responsible for causing pneumonia, meningitis, and also middle ear infections. 
And then we talk Streptococcus mutans. It contributes to dental caries. Streptococcus pyogenes. It causes the most diseases. It can cause pharyngitis, which is commonly called strep throat, impetigo in infants, mild skin disease, scarlet fever. It's a strain that produces a red rash. Rheumatic fever, which forms endotoxins, and also necrotizing fasciitis, which is a flesh-eating bacteria. So here we can appreciate actual Streptococcus pyogenes bacteria here. And then here you can see impetigo. And here we've got flesh-eating disease caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. Next, let's talk Staphylococcus aureus and MRSA. First, when we talk Staphylococcus aureus, you'll see about 20% of the people are carriers on their skin without any symptoms. The disease is usually limited to skin infections. Now, when we talk MRSA, MRSA stands for methicillin, which is a type of antibiotic, resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So we can see here a strain resistant to methicillin is called MRSA. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's very dangerous. It can kill young, otherwise healthy individuals. MRSA often possesses genes that are coding for toxins that are not going to be found in other Staph aureus strains, making it very dangerous. Next in here, we can see tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is going to be a very dangerous disease as well. It's caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now here what happens is we develop active lesions in the lung that cause tubercles which form from immune response and then they become calcified. Here we can appreciate one of those tubercles right inside of here and then here in greater detail under the microscope. When we talk tuberculosis, tuberculosis is going to be a leading cause of death worldwide due to infectious disease. Today, about a third of the world's population is going to be infected, causing about 2 million deaths per year. Tuberculosis is going to be a chronic disease that's caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which we can see is very slow growing. Tuberculosis usually affects the lungs. However, you need to know, especially when you're getting into the medical field, that it can occur elsewhere. Next, then let's check out the symptoms. The symptoms are going to include inflammation of the lungs, also the formation of tubercles from active lesions. The tubercles can persist for years, causing coughing and spreading the bacteria within the lungs. The tubercles can persist for years, causing coughing and spreading the bacteria within the lungs or to other areas of the body. Now, damaged lung tissue, it hardens and it calcifies, which then is going to be visible on x-rays. All right, next then let's talk food poisoning. There's two types of bacteria that cause food poisoning. Some are going to produce a toxin while growing in food. Others we'll see are going to cause an infection while growing in the intestine. So here we'll see when we talk producing a toxin while growing in food, those ones usually cause vomiting and diarrhea and they are sometimes self-limiting. However, there's one type that's called Clostridium botulinum, and it produces one of the most toxic substances on earth. Now, some that cause an infection while growing in the intestines will include salmonella, and this causes symptoms after several days of growing. All right, next, then let's talk about drug control of bacterial diseases. We'll see most antibiotics are going to kill or inhibit bacteria by interfering with their metabolic pathways. And they can do this by inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis or by inhibiting bacterial cell wall synthesis. Now, when we talk inhibiting bacterial protein synthesis, they can do this by binding to their ribosomes. So here we can see that will include antibiotics such as erythromycin and tetracyclines. And we talk inhibiting cell wall biosynthesis. Penicillins and cephalosporins will be responsible for doing that. Let's check out some problems related to antibiotic therapy. You can have potentially fatal allergic reactions in patients. You can kill off the normal flora, which includes beneficial bacteria. And this may allow the overgrowth of certain harmful bacteria, for example, in the intestinal tract or yeast in the vagina. You can have bacterial resistance, 
and this can happen due to mutations. The new strains are going to have evolved and they're going to be resistant to typical antibiotic therapy. Sometimes bacteria can exchange genetic material and that includes antibiotic resistance genes, which is bad for us. All right, next let's talk about viruses, viroids, and prions. All right, when we talk viruses, I'd like you to know viruses are not composed of cells. They are acellular structures. Viruses, we'll see, are obligate parasites, meaning that they are going to reproduce only inside a living cell that's called the host cell. And they'll do that by utilizing at least some of the machinery, so the ribosomes or certain enzymes of that cell. And when we talk viroids, viroids are going to be simpler forms of viruses. Prions, prions we're going to talk about as well, they're going to be simpler than viruses also. Let's talk viral size and structure. We'll see most viruses are going to be smaller than bacteria. They range in size from 0.03 to about 0.2 micrometers in size. We'll see viruses are going to come in a variety of shapes, such as helix-shaped viruses. We can have viruses that are going to be spherical. Some of our viruses will be polyhedrons. And they can have even more complex forms to them. A virus is always going to have two main parts to it. An outer capsid, which is going to be composed of protein units that protect the inner core of nucleic acids. The capsid can be surrounded by a membrane called an envelope. The envelope is made of lipid and it's usually derived from the host cell plasma membrane. The second main component is going to be the nucleic acid core, which can be either DNA or RNA. Both DNA and RNA may be single or double-stranded. So here we can appreciate a couple of pictures of some viruses. So this first virus we see here is an adenovirus. Again, this is the virus that one company, I believe AstraZeneca, is using for COVID vaccines. And this is being isolated from, I believe, the chimpanzee stool. The adenovirus is a DNA virus with a polyhedral capsid and a fiber at each corner, which you can appreciate right inside of here. So here you've got the capsid. And then when we look at the capsid in greater detail, you can see all the protein units. And then again, the fiber, the fiber protein, and then we have DNA inside. Next in here, we can look at the influenza virus. This is an RNA virus with a helical capsid surrounded by an envelope with spikes on it. So you can see that here. Here are all those spikes. And here's the envelope surrounding the capsid. And then here we have RNA inside. Again, we can appreciate both viruses very well. Next then, I want to talk to you about viroids and prions. When we talk viroids and prions, they are acellular pathogens. They are acellular pathogens. Viroid replication causes diseases in plants, which are going to be the only known hosts. Now, when we talk about the mechanisms of potato spindle tuber and apple scar skin, they're not that well known. So when we talk prions, prions are going to be proteinaceous infectious particles. They are proteinaceous infectious particles that cause degenerative diseases of the nervous system of humans and other animals. Maybe you have heard of mad cow disease. That's one example there. All right, next then let's move to protists and fungi. Let's talk protists and fungi. I'd like you to know the first eukaryotic cell arose from a prokaryotic cell about 1.7 billion years ago, it's believed. The domain eukarya is going to be divided into four kingdoms. Those four kingdoms include, if you recall, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. 
When we talk protists, I'd like you to know protists are generally microscopic and unicellular. This sets them apart from other eukaryotes. Protists can be unicellular, colonial, meaning they live in large groups, or they can be even multicellular. They are structurally diverse. They have many complex shapes to them. When we talk about the diversity, the diversity is such that it's easier to identify them as any eukaryotic organism that is not a plant, animal, or a fungus. Prokaryotes are most likely related to the first eukaryotic cell to have evolved. Now, we also have the endosymbiotic theory. The endosymbiotic theory suggests that mitochondria may have resulted when a nucleated cell engulfed aerobic bacteria. Chloroplasts may have originated when a nucleated cell with mitochondria engulfed cyanobacteria. Now when we talk protists, protists are going to help bridge the gap between eukaryotic cells and multicellular organisms. When we talk fungi, plants, and animals, they all trace their ancestry to a protist. When we talk about the biology of protists, they're going to be structurally diverse. They can be unicellular, colonial, or multicellular, as I mentioned. They also may have a cell wall, a shell, or test, which is basically of minerals. They may even, they can even have a cell wall, a shell, or a test. They may have organelles that are not found in other eukaryotes, such as a contractile vacuole which is there for osmoregulation, especially in freshwater habitats. They can have pellicles, which are going to be responsible for maintaining the cell shape and allow for better locomotion in the water. And some can have eye spot apparatuses, which allows sensation of light intensity. So let's check out then the diversity of protists. Protists are going to be traditionally classified by their source of energy and nutrients. Algae are considered photosynthetic. Protozoans are heterotrophic by ingestion. And then water molds and slime molds are going to be heterotrophic by absorption. And we'll see newer genetic sequence information has resulted in controversy. One system uses six supergroups. Taxonomic level just below domain is kind of how we'll use it as well. So each of these uh, are going to represent a separate evolutionary lineage. So here we can see we've got photosynthetic protists, which fall under algae. And then we have flagellates, ciliates, amoeboids and sporozoans, which are going to be protozoas. And then we have water molds and slime molds, which are going to be fungus-like protists. All right, so next then let's check out our different algae. So here we've got Chlamydomonas, which is a type of motile unicellular green algae. And then here we can see Chlamydomonas is going to be a unicellular green algae with two flagella. And then there's also Volvox, which is going to be a colonial green algae. And then we have Spirogyra, which is going to be a filamentous green algae. Here we can appreciate diatoms. And here we have dinoflagellates. They contain a reddish brown pigment, and they're going to be responsible for red tides, red tides that occur. And then next we can talk about red algae. Red algae is mainly multicellular seaweeds. And it's going to contain red and blue pigments as well as chlorophyll. Red algae is going to produce useful gelling agents for us, such as agar and carrageenan. And next time we talk brown algae, brown algae is going to include multicellular seaweeds. Brown algae will contain accessory pigments ranging in color from beige to black. Brown algae produces algin gelatinous products that are going to be used in foods. The Sargasso Sea has large floating mats of brown algae like we're seeing here in this picture. All right, next then we have our euglena. Our euglena are going to be fresh water, single-celled organisms, and many have chloroplasts, but some do not. They have also, you can see, two flagella, a short flagellum and a long flagellum. So you can see that here very well. Here we can see one underneath the microscope. And here we've got both pictures. Next are our ciliates. Our ciliates are going to be the largest group of protozoans. They all have cilia, which are hair-like structures, and they rhythmically beat. They're going to be used in movement and to capture prey. 
Most ciliates are going to be freely motile, but some can be anchored. Paramecium, for example, is going to be the most widely known ciliate. It's got visible contractile vacuoles. It's got a macronucleus, which produces mRNA and directs metabolism. And it does conjugation, which is a form of sexual reproduction. Here we can appreciate one type of ciliate, a stentor. Here we have paramecium. And here we have conjugation occurring between two paramecia. Then we have amoeboids. When we talk amoeboids, they usually live in aquatic environments such as oceans and freshwater lakes or ponds. And here we can see they contain food vacuoles, contractile vacuoles, mitochondria, and then also a nice nucleus with the nucleolus. And then here we can appreciate some planktonic animals. Here we have foraminiferin, and we also have globigerina. And we can appreciate the white cliffs of Dover, England. And the last we can appreciate here some radiolarian tests. And then we had, again, we also saw water molds, slime molds, right? fungus like protus, and then sporozoans. Next, let's move to fungi. Let's talk fungi. Now, when we talk fungi, I'd like you to know they're going to belong to the domain Eukarya, the kingdom fungi. Fungi are a structurally diverse group of strict heterotrophs. Fungi release enzymes into their external environment and they digest food outside the body. A new fungi has been found, it's parasitic. Most fungi we can see are going to be saprophytic and they decompose plants, animals, and microbes. Along with bacteria, we can see fungi are important to ecosystems by recycling inorganic nutrients and they can degrade cellulose and lignin. When we talk about the body of a fungus, we'll see the body of a fungus is going to be composed of a mass of individual filaments that are called hyphae. They're called hyphae. Collectively, the mass of filaments is called mycelium. Mycelium. Some fungi have cross walls. These cross walls are going to divide the hypha into a chain of cells. These hypha are termed septate. Septa have pores that are going to allow the cytoplasm and even organelles to pass from one cell to another. Non-septate fungi, they have no cross walls and hypha are multinucleated. Fungal cell walls are going to contain chitin instead of cellulose. Chitin is like cellulose and it's a polymer of glucose. Glycogen is going to be used as an energy reserve as in animal cells. Fungi are going to be non-motile. They move towards a food source by growing toward it. By growing towards it. So here we can see fungal mycelia on a corn tortilla. I'm sure most of us have seen this in real life. So here we can appreciate specialized fungal hypha that bear spores. Here you can appreciate those spores. And then here we have non-septate hypha. Here then we can see we have water mold. And then here we can appreciate the life cycle of a plasmodial slime mold. So here you can see meiosis will hit the young sporangium causing it to become a mature sporangium, which releases spores. Those germinating spores, then you can see, are going to give rise to... Those germinating spores, then, are going to give rise to amoeboid cells and flagellated cells, which will then undergo fertilization, forming a zygote and a young plasmodium, and then a mature plasmodium, which then undergoes sporangia formation. And again, young sporangia is formed, and the cycle will continue. Here we can appreciate a septate hypha. 
Here you can appreciate a septate hyphen. You can see all the septate helping it to be non-multinucleated. Here then we can appreciate a septate hypha, and you can appreciate the differences between the septate hypha and the non-septate hypha. And you can appreciate why we call this multinucleated then. 